Shall I start, Neeraj? Uh, yes. We are live now. Welcome to Ortho TV online OC webinar series. Uh, this is the 17th live webinar on DDH and SCFE. So over to the president of Pediatric Orthopedic Society of India, Dr. Diren Ganjwala. Good morning, POSI members and the overseas uh, viewers who are watching this uh, 17th live webinar of Pediatric Orthopedic Society of India. I welcome uh, Professor Hiroshi Kito from Japan, and I am really happy to share with you that this is a unique uh, webinar. The reason is because most of the webinar we are doing are basically from the English speaking world, so countries. So this is really a unique webinar because there are 50% of the countries in the world who are not speaking English as a first language, and they are also managing the various conditions. So it's very interesting to know about their perspective, about the, their views, how they manage this condition. Now I request uh, our member, Gaurav Gupta, to introduce our faculty. Just to give you a background that two years back, Gaurav attended the Japanese Pediatric Orthopedic Association Fellowship, and he visited professor, and he saw this work, which is very different than what we are doing. So he suggested that uh, we should have this webinar. So now I request uh, Dr. Gaurav to introduce professor. Thank you. So thank you, Dr. Diren. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, let me introduce Dr. Hiroshi Kito to all of you. He is currently the deputy director of Aichi Children's Health and Medical Center, Obu. When I visited him in 2018, Dr. Hiroshi was an associate professor and head of pediatric orthopedics and skeletal dysplasia specialties at Nagoya University Graduate School of Medicine, Nagoya, Japan. He is also the vice president of Japanese Pediatric Orthopedic Association and has more than 30 years of experience with 120 publications to his credit. His research interest is genetic and metastasis and bone and cartilage regeneration. And he has recently published a book on the same. He was visiting scientist at Sedar Sinai Medical Center, Los Angeles in the Department of Genetics way back in 1997 and 98. I was very lucky to be a traveling fellow at Nagoya University and Aichi Children's Hospital in 2008 and learn directly from Dr. Hiroshi and his team. So without wasting much time, I would ask Dr. Hiroshi to start his presentation. Please, sir. Thank you very much for your kind introduction. Uh, I'm Hiroshi Kito. Uh, I'm going to start my talk. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk about our treatment strategies for DDH and Skiffy in this web meeting. Can you share the screen? Sharing the screen has not yet started. I'd like to introduce myself briefly. Dr. Ah, Dr. Dr. We cannot see your screen. Uh, Dr. Hiroshi, we cannot see your yeah, screen. Yeah. The director of IGH. Yes, now we can see. Okay. Just yeah. put on the slideshow, please. Yeah. Okay. Thank you yes. for giving me the opportunity to talk about our treatment strategies for the DH and Skiffy in this web meeting. I would like to introduce myself briefly. I'm here. Hiroshi Kito, Deputy Director of Aichi Children's Health and Medical Center. Since 2000, I have performed various clinical and research studies regarding pediatric orthopedic diseases in Nagoya University. I would like to introduce my clinical and research interests before starting my talk. My major research interests are bone regeneration and skeletal dysplasias. 
we have developed a novel cell therapy using cultural expanded bone marrow cells and platelet rich plasma during limb lengthening procedures. We extract bone marrow from iliac crest and culture the adherent cells for three weeks with the osteogenic medium containing dexamethasone and obtain osteoblast-like cells. We also extract autologous platelet-rich plasma, which was mixed with cultured osteoblast-like cells, and then transplanted this mixture into the destruction gap to promote CARS formation. We have reported favorable clinical outcome of this cell therapy. Next focus is on achondroplasia, which is characterized by short limb short stature and is caused by overactivation of FGFR3. We comprehensively screen the existing drugs that suppress FGFR3 signaling and identified that meclidin, an over-the-counter drug used for motion sickness, inhibit FGFR3 signaling in various chondrocytic cells and promoted longitudinal bone growth in achondroplasia mouse model. We completed a phase 1A clinical trial and now preparing phase 1B study. The third topic is about fibrodysplasia ossificans progressiva, which is a severely disabling heritable disorder of connective tissue characterized by progressive heterotopic ossification in various extraskeletal sites. We also found that uh, rapamycin has an ability to prevent heterotopic ossification in FOP, mouse model. And now we are conducting phase two clinical trial in Japan. Aichi Prefecture is located at the center of Japan. It takes uh, 100 minutes to Tokyo, 40 minutes to Kyoto by Super Express train. Aichi is the fourth largest pre prefecture in Japan. Toyota Motor Corporation is in Aichi Prefecture. Let's start talking on DDH. Multi-center study for DDH in Japan demonstrated age diagnosis in our country. Hip screening is generally performed at the three to four month of age by pediatricians and suspected cases are referred to orthopedists. Therefore, DDH is the most often diagnosed at three to six months of age. Approximately 200 cases were diagnosed after one year of age, which is accounting for 15% of the total DDH cases. Delay in diagnosis is a serious concern issue. The slide shows final reduction method. Conservative treatment is predominant even in children after walking age. For children who are six months of age or younger, public harness treatment is a golden standard method. We reviewed 221 hips treated with public harness in our institution. 
181 hips were reduced and the rate of reduction was 81.9%. We examined the predictive factors associated with failure of reduction and uh, demonstrated that smaller distance A, larger distance B, and severe adduction contracture were associated factors to failure of reduction. The rate of AVM determined by Salter classification was 8.8%. Smaller distance A and severe adduction contracture were correlative factors for the incidence of AVM. I would like to introduce our gradual reduction using overhead traction method. Indications for OHT are the DDH children who are the age of seven months or older or who failed public harness treatment. OHT is consisted of three phases including four weeks of horizontal traction, followed by one week of vertical traction and one week of above knee traction. Spontaneous reduction is usually obtained at the early phase of above knee traction. After confirming an eventful reduction by arthrography, the hips were immobilized by hip spiker cast for four weeks. The first phase is horizontal skin traction with mildly abducted position. The traction force ranged from 1 to 2.5 kilogram, depending on the patient's body weight. Skin traction is performed using bandaging track bands, a jacket, and a belt. We developed home traction device and introduced the home traction system during the last three weeks of horizontal traction period. Radiographic examination is performed when the patient is put in traction at the end of the first phase to evaluate the descent of the femoral head. The sufficient descent was defined as the femoral head movement to the level of Hirugen liner line. When the sufficient descent is obtained, the patient moved to vertical traction. The second phase is vertical traction using the OHT device. The traction force is the same as horizontal traction. The hips are fixed with the flexion in 100 degrees at the second day of vertical traction. Hip abduction was increased daily up to 70 degrees. The hips are fixed with a flexion of 19 degrees in the first day of the vertical traction. Next day, the apparatus that fixed the patient's buttock moved to caudal side, resulting in the hip flexed in 100 degrees. Subsequent vertical traction is maintained with the hip flexed in 100 degrees. The final phase is above knee traction. The knees are allowed to move freely to reduce muscle tone of the adductors and hamstrings. 
the dislocated hip is usually reduced spontaneously within one day, which can be confirmed by palpation and ultrasound. Thereafter, the traction force is gradually decreased to 0.5 kg to concentrate the femoral head into the acetabulum. Reduction and soft tissue interpositions were carefully monitored by ultrasound until following arthrography and cast fixation. Dynamic arthrography under general anesthesia is performed to assess the retention of reduction, soft tissue interpositions, and an optimal fixation position for immobilization. The hip is subsequently immobilized in a hip spiker cast for four weeks in the optimal position. Generally, 90 degrees of flexion, 70 degrees of abduction, and neutral rotation. Determination and fixation of an optimal position for cast is very important to stimulate disappearance of intraarticular soft tissue interpositions. After the cast removal, a variable flexion abduction brace is applied for approximately three months until concentric reduction is achieved. Patients are fixed with Lorentz position for one month with decreased flexion abduction brace for one month and with a brace without body part for additional one month. We reviewed 75 hips in 67 DDH patients who were treated with GROHT over seven months of age. Long-term outcome with an average age at the latest follow-up of 16.7 years was evaluated. 72 hips were reduced. Two require subsequent closed reduction and one underwent open reduction. AVN occurred in two hips. The rate of reduction was 96% and the rate of occurrence of AVN was 2.7%. Residual acetabular dysplasia was observed in two thirds of the patients and Salter in nominate osteotomy was performed in 41.3% of the patient. Finally, 82.7% of the hips showed satisfactory outcome of severing classes one or two at skeletal maturity. Our OHT treatment showed higher rate of reduction and lower rate of complications compared with previously reported open reduction or closed reduction. Rampel et al. performed gradual reduction with hip abduction and internal rotation and showed similar results to our treatment. We next review the outcome of GROHT for working age DDH patients. 68 hips in 66 patients with an average age at reduction of 20 months were treated with GROHT. The average follow-up period was 8.6 years. All but one hip were reduced, but two of them were re-dislocated later. One OHG resistant hip was treated with closed reduction. AVN was never occurred 
in this series. Forty hips underwent solitary osteotomy, and one underwent combined solitary and femoral osteotomy. 86% showed favorable outcome of severing classes one or two. These results were better than previously reported studies of conservative treatment for working age DDH patients. For the patients who have a residual acetabular dysplasia after GROHT, we performed a solitary in nominate osteotomy for reconstructive surgery between five and six years of age. Indications for solitary surgery include acetabular index of 30 degrees or more, or center edge angle of five degrees or less. We reviewed our patients who underwent solitary osteotomy and found that CE angle and acetabular index improved approximately 20 degrees and 13 degrees respectively. In addition, majority of patients who underwent solitary osteotomy showed improvement of acetabular coverage during a post-operative follow-up period. I would like to present some DDH cases who were treated GROHT combined with solitary osteotomy over three years of age. This is a right DDH initially treated at the age of three year, 11 month. Right hip was reduced by GROHT, but severe acetabular dysplasia was seen at the age of 5.5 years. Solitary osteotomy was performed at the age of six years, and she showed spherical femoral head with favorable acetabular coverage at skeletal maturity. Arthrography at the time of reduction revealed very thick soft tissue interposition at the acetabular floor, but it spontaneously disappeared at the time of solitary surgery. This is a three-year, four-month female with left DDH. The left hip was reduced by GROHT, and the solitary surgery was performed at the age of five years. Her left hip was normally remodeled at the age of 11 years. At the time of reduction, marked inverted limbs was interposed between a stabulum and femoral head. But the soft tissue interposition was spontaneously disappeared and the sharp limbs was remodeled. This is a male DDH patient diagnosed at the age of three year, one month. His right hip was reduced by GROHT and residual acetabular dysplasia was reconstructed by solitary osteotomy at the age of six years. He showed almost normal configuration of his right hip at skeletal maturity. He also demonstrated marked inverted limbs and a thick soft tissue interposition at the acetabular floor at reduction. But these abnormal soft tissues spontaneously disappeared before osteotomy. The last case is a three-year, seven-month female with right DDH. 
All right, it was successfully reduced by GROHT, but severe cerebral dysplasia was seen at the age of six years. Salter osteotomy was performed and finally demonstrated favorable acetabular coverage with a spherical femoral head at skeletal maturity. This case also showed thick soft tissue interposition at that time of reduction. It spontaneously disappeared and sharp limbs was seen before shorter surgery. Our conservative treatment using GROHT can be successfully applied for DDH patients under four years of age. <clears throat> Extra articular obstacles for reduction include adapter lungs, iliopsis, gluteus muscles, and contracted joint capsule. Gradual horizontal and vertical traction can fully stretch these muscles and fibrous tissues, leading to a traumatic reduction of the femoral head. Intra-articular obstacles, including ligamentous terrace, inverted limbs, and interposed soft tissues cannot be managed by traction but the repeated arthrographies we showed here demonstrated spontaneous disappearance of soft tissue interposition and sharply remodeled limbs. We assumed that ligamentous teres could be atrophied because there were no obvious interpositions at the acetabular floor before shoulder surgery. Some hips show residual acetabular dysplasia after GROHT treatment, but we can successfully treat these hips by shoulder osteotomy. Open reduction sometimes results in coxa magna deformity of the femoral head, which causes incongruency of the hip joint and lead to osteoarthritis. GROHT associated with the osteotomy, on the other hand, is an extra articular procedure that can maintain the spherical femoral head. Now let's move to the unstable skiffy. Our strategy for patients with the stable skiffy is based on the degree of posterior slip angle. We perform in situ pinning for the hips with slip angle of 45 degrees or less, and the subtrochanteric corrective osteotomy for the hips with slip angle of more than 45 degrees. We apply percutaneous proximal femoral flexion osteotomy using an external fixator. This technique is minimally invasive, safe, and effective in correcting multiplanar deformities associated with stable skiffy. In 2016, Otani et al. reported the results of the Japanese multi center study of the treatment for unstable skiffy. Approximately half of the physicians performed in situ pinning without intentional, some incidental reduction. Pinning after gentle reduction was the second commonest procedure. In our country, modified down procedure is not yet common. In regard to duration between onset and surgery, majority of physicians performed surgery within a few days. The urgent surgery within 24 hours of sleep 
as well as waiting surgery after eight days were not common in our country. One fourth of the physicians preferred traction before surgery. Recent reported incidents of AVN in an unstable skiffy included 11% after inside to pinning with joint decompression, 8.7% after pinning with or without reduction. The rates of AVN after modified down procedure varies from 6 to 26%. This is probably due to the clinical complexity of the procedure. We reviewed our patients with unstable skiffy who are treated at Nagoya University Hospital or Aichi Children's Health and Medical Center since 2003 and followed up at least one year after surgery. Clinical data including age at onset, body mass index, the presence of hormonal abnormalities, and the duration between onset and surgery were obtained from the medical records. Pure and the post-operative head shaft angle, and the post-operative and the latest posterior tilting angle were measured from anteroposterior and Lowenstein hip radiographs. Clinical outcomes were evaluated at the latest range of motion of the hip joint and modified Harris hip score. I would like to describe details of our treatment regimen for unstable skiffy. Immediately after the diagnosis of unstable skiffy, a Kirshner wire was inserted in the distal femur under local anesthesia. Then skeletal traction was commenced with an affected hip in a flexed position of approximately 45 degrees. Gradual reduction was radiographically monitored and we adjusted the weight during the traction period for one week or more. The patient was then transferred to the operating room and fixed gently in a traction table without intensive traction under general anesthesia. Epiphysiodesis was performed using two cannulated SCFE screws. No post-operative immobilization was encouraged, but weight bearing was prohibited for a minimal period of three months after surgery. After confirming that there was no presence of AVN by MRI, partial weight bearing was allowed. Full weight wearing was commenced at six months after surgery. When the AVN was found, non weight bearing period was extended. This is the outcome of the 12 unstable skiffy patients. The average age at surgery was 11.7 years. The body mass index was average of 23.2 and the average duration of traction was 11.3 days. There were no patients with hormonal abnormalities. The average of preoperative and postoperative head shaft angle was 124 and 139 degrees respectively. The post-operative posterior tilting angle was 32.2 degrees, which decreased to the 22.3 degrees at the latest follow-up, indicating approximately 10 degrees of improvement during follow-up period. 
only one patient showed mild AVM. Neither pain nor restricted ROM of the hip joint was observed. All patients had the perfect score of modified Harris hip score with 2.6 years of average follow-up period. I would like to show some cases. K6 is a 10.8 year old female. She showed unstable skiffy with the head shaft angle of 104 degrees in her left hip and gradual skeletal traction was performed for 10 days preoperatively. Post-operative radiographs demonstrated reduced femoral epiphysis with the head shaft angle of 146 degrees and the posterior tilting angle of 33 degrees. At the latest follow-up, she showed spherical femoral head with no evidence of AVN. This is a case who had AVN. Posteriorly displaced femoral epiphysis was fixed with two skiffy screws and the prophylactic pinning was performed on the contralateral side. Coronal T1 weighted MRI image taken a three month after surgery indicated linear low intensity area at the subchondral region of the affected hip. Non-weight bearing period was extended and follow-up MRI at one year after surgery demonstrated disappearance of the abnormal signal intensity. Hip radiographs at the age of 10.8 years revealed spherical femoral head with no evidence of collapse. This is the case who was diagnosed one month after the onset of the disease. She had acute right thigh pain during sport activity and local doctor misdiagnosed her as muscle rupture and instructed to rest. She couldn't bear weight for one month until referral to our hospital. Hip MRI images demonstrate remarkable metaphysial bone edema with intraarticular fluid. CT showed anterolateral metaphysial bump due to femoral acetabular impingement. Skeletal traction was immediately commenced after hospitalization. Skeletal traction with increasing weight was continued for nine days preoperatively. Displaced femoral epiphysis with the head shaft angle of 96 degrees was unintentionally reduced to the head shaft angle of 117 degrees. Post-operative posterior tilting angle was 48 degrees with the anterolateral metaphysial bump. At the age of 13.2 years, however, spontaneous disappearance of the bump was observed associated with improvement of the posterior tilting angle during the follow-up period. She had spherical femoral head with no evidence of AVN and impingement. Gradual traction with the hip in a flexed position could facilitate a reduction of the posteriorly displaced femoral epiphysis atraumatically and relieve the kinking or twisting of the posterior superior retinacular vessels. The human cadaver study indicated that intraarticular pressure of the hip joint showed the lowest in 45 degrees of flexion position. 
Therefore, gradual reduction with the hip in a flexed position may contribute to prevention of ABN occurrence by reducing intra-articular pressure. We gradually reduce the femoral epiphysis by prolonged skeletal traction, followed by fixation on the traction table with an unintentional traction. Mild to moderate slip was observed immediately after percutaneous spinning, but the average final posterior tilting angle was 22.3 degrees, whereas post-operative posterior tilting angle was 32.2 degrees, indicating remodeling of approximately 10 degrees after pinning could be expected during the residual growth. We also demonstrated the evidence of spontaneous disappearance of the metaphysial bump in the current study. Prolonged skeletal traction with the hip in a flexed position of 45 degrees is an atraumatic gradual reduction of the femoral epiphysis and could reduce intra-articular pressure preoperatively. Percutaneous pinning with two skiffy screws after unintentional reduction using a traction table remains mild to moderate slip, but femoral acetabular impingement could be avoidable through the remodeling of the femoral head during the residual growth. This technique is easy and minimally invasive with low incidence of AVN for unstable skiffy patients. In conclusion, Gradual reduction using overhead traction with or without solter osteotomy can be applied for DDH patients who are four years of age or younger. Percutaneous spinning after prolonged skeletal traction with increased flexion has a favorable long-term outcome with a low incidence of AVN. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you, Professor Kito. Uh, Thank you very much. Me? Yeah, can, can we stop sharing me? the screen? Uh, Professor Kito, are you able to hear me? Yeah, I have stopped the screen share. Yeah. Yeah, Dr. Kito, can you hear me? Yeah, OK. Hello. Hello. Can you hear me, Dr. Kito? Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, so that was a real eye opener the way you managed to reduce AVN and demonstrated such beautiful remodeling of uh, the uh, femoral head the, and the neck junction between unstable slips. So there are a few questions which I would like to pose to you, which our members have asked. So uh, the first question is regarding DDH. Dr. Ramani, our past president from Delhi, wants to know, is there a difference in the hospital stay between young infants versus older children in your traction treatment for DDA? It's hard to, it is hard. Your voice, hard to hear. Yes, Sandeep, can you stop your video and then uh, repeat the question? Can you hear me now? Yeah, yes. okay. Is there a difference between the hospital stay when you are treating young infants versus older children? Oh, no. Uh, there, uh, only, uh, the procedure is uh, uh, standardized uh, for uh, younger children and uh, older children. Same okay. as they do. Second question was, but, 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 but uh, I'm sorry, but uh, yes. in, in all the patient, uh, the descent of uh, femoral head uh, is sometimes difficult 
So uh, the horizontal traction uh, sometimes uh, longer in older patient than younger patient. Okay, so you may need more horizontal traction. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the second question was, how do you monitor at home, especially for neurological complications? Um, uh, at the beginning uh, of uh, home traction, uh, we sometimes uh, uh, see the patient's home. Okay, but, home visits. You mean yeah, home visits? But uh, uh, almost all patients can well uh, manage by uh, parents. So nowadays, uh, we have no monitor okay. in so, home traction. So and, you uh, may... there, there are no uh, neurological complications. So you teach the parents how to monitor and what are the red flags if they see they should report to you, something like that? Uh, yeah. Uh, I recommend uh, parents to see the patient's uh, uh, ankle uh, motion, active motion. Okay, ankle active motion. Yeah. Okay. The next question was, how does the transverse acetabular ligament behave without traction alone? Mm -hmm. How does the transverse acetabular ligament behave with traction treatment? Uh, transverse ligament? Yes. How does it behave with the traction treatment? Uh, probably, uh, I, I don't see exactly. Uh, I don't check the transverse ligament because uh, conservative treatment. Uh, we assume that the, uh, like uh, ligamentous teres, uh, transverse ligament could be atrophied. Okay. So you believe it will remodel after reduction on its own? Yeah, yeah, yes. Okay, you don't give it any special different attention? Yeah. Okay, uh, have you tried open reduction at all or you have given it up totally is the next question. Uh, for the patient who uh, couldn't obtain the uh, reduction by overhead traction, uh, we tried closed reduction. Uh, the patient who cannot reduce by closed reduction, uh, we perform the open reduction. Okay, so what was the percentage? Ah, uh, uh, probably uh, less than 1%. Less than 1%, including older children. Mm -hmm. That includes older children. Yeah. Okay, so that is- We, we, rarely, we rarely perform the open reduction. Okay, that's, that's really amazing. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and uh, there is a question from Bangladesh. Uh, the gentleman, Dr. Kaisur, is asking, uh, during the Salter innominate osteotomy for dysplasia, at that time, do you open the hip and clear the acetabular floor? Mm -hmm. oh. The doctor from Bangladesh wants to ask, during mm -hmm. Salter osteotomy, when you do later Salter osteotomy, mm -hmm. at that time, do you open the hip and clear the acetabular floor or it's a closed procedure? Uh, we have never opened the hip joint. Okay, so you believe that hip need not be opened at all? Yeah, yeah. Okay, and he also asked, do you think the pulvinar is responsible for the residual dysplasia? Mm -hmm. He is asking, do you think the soft tissue obstruction is responsible for acetabular dysplasia, despite a good reduction? A soft tissue? Does the soft tissue contribute to residual acetabular dysplasia? Uh, we haven't uh, uh, performed the lengthening of the uh, adductor and the iliopsis. Only osteotomy, extra, okay. extra osteotomy. Okay, okay. Uh, Dr. Tushar Agarwal wants to ask, what is your safe zone? Oh, uh, 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 in the, in under general anesthesia, uh, we check the point of uh, re-dislocated. So fraction, and uh, adduction. 
So uh, once we reduce the, uh, no, uh, spontaneously reduce the hip at the uh, uh, flexed abduction position, uh, under general anesthesia, we gradually extended the okay. legs. Yeah, and uh, abducted legs. And so the re-dislocated point, so the safe, uh, we can uh, see the safe zone of the patient. Okay, okay. Uh, there is one more question regarding the slip SCFE from Dr. Ramani. Mm -hmm. uh, in an unstable slip, do you not believe that the unstable slip has already in an environment to cause AVN, like a fracture? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, in our series, uh, there are only one AVN, but uh, I think the at the traumatic uh, accident, uh, AVN could be occurred, uh, irrespective of the treatment. Okay, so you think the AVN is irrespective of the treatment? Mm -hmm. Okay, and do you believe in decompression of the joint before you initiate the reduction maneuver? Uh, we haven't uh, examined the pressure, intraarticular pressure, but uh, we uh, monitor the by ultrasound to okay. uh, uh, yeah hip swelling. Uh, when the patient is on traction, you monitor with ultrasound the hip swelling. Yeah. yeah. Okay, and after about eight days, you will position him on fracture table and then fix with the two screws. Yeah. Uh, only. The, uh, put the patient on the traction table. It is important uh, to avoid traction. Okay, no, on the on the traction table, it is only positioning for ease of screw placement. Yeah, there is no is reduction it. maneuver done or no traction applied. No traction, only put. Okay. Yeah. Okay, and there is a question. Your screws uh, seem to be a little long on the lateral cortex. Do they cause problem on the lateral cortex? Lat uh, oh, screw. Oh, uh, we remove the screw after the uh, closure of the uh, physis. So okay. uh, it is easy to remove uh, remove the screw. Uh, okay. so you we, leave we, them long for ease of removal. Yeah, uh, I uh, use the screw 1.5 centimeter uh, longer than the actual length. Okay, okay. You prefer to do it electrically? Yeah. Okay. Uh, the second one more question from Professor Sakti Das is how compliant is your small child to traction? How many hours in a day is he on traction? Hmm? How many hours in the day is the baby on traction for DDH? The horizontal and vertical traction. Is it 24 hours or 8 hours or 10 hours in the day? Uh, excuse me? How many hours of the day does the child remain on traction? Is it continuous or there are fixed hours? Um, I'm sorry, it is. Uh, uh, I cannot uh, see uh, exactly your voice. Okay, let me uh, let me repeat the question. Yeah, yeah, the yeah. question is uh, like whether the child is in the hospital or at home. Uh, the traction is continuous, means all throughout the day for seven days or 24 days, uh, uh, 21 days, or you keep it only for 10 hours in a day or 14 hours in a day. Oh, I okay. think it's a continuous traction. That is what uh, your paper says. Yeah. Uh, in horizontal traction, uh, about uh, 23 uh, hours per day. Uh, I uh, We... Uh, recommend uh, only a uh, bath or a shower, uh, one hour per day. Uh, so uh, we continue uh, uh, traction for uh, 23 hours a day okay. in uh, horizontal traction. And uh, in vertical traction, uh, 24 hours traction. Okay. And what about the feeding? Like when the child is being fed, uh, given uh, milk or the food, how do you manage at that time? Only a uh, uh, patient uh, feed uh, lying. So uh, the minimal age 
of the patient is uh, seven months. Yeah, uh, the more younger children cannot feed uh, lying. There is one more question from Dr. Tintan. Uh, how do you decide the trajectory of your screw or CP after incidental reduction? Mm -hmm. How do you decide the trajectory of your screw for CP fixation? Uh, now, Sandeep, we are not able to hear you. Hmm? We are not able to hear you. Can you hear me now? Uh, dar darling, could you please uh, uh, repeat? What is the trajectory of your screw for CP after incidental reduction? The question is the direction of the screw, the trajectory of the screw, the direction of the screw. Oh, oh, oh yeah. Uh, uh, perpendicular to the crisis. OK. Uh, there is another question. Is the protocol same for syndromic DDH, like arthrogryposis or non-idiopathic DDH? Uh, uh, we showed here the DDH, uh, not teratologic DJ, DDH. Uh, we performed uh, for the patients with the teratologic DDH, such as uh, arthrogryposis, but the reduction rate is uh, decreased. Uh, for the arthrogryposis, uh, uh, we can uh, have the reduction rate of uh, approximately 50%. Uh, it is okay. uh, yeah, very difficult for the teratologic DDH. But you will still start with the same approach. Mm -hmm. But you will still start with the same approach. Uh, yeah, yeah, we, uh, you will try. Uh, the DD uh, OOHT, but uh, sometimes uh, we need a uh, uh, surgery for teratologic DDH. Okay. Okay. Can I ask a question? Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, the question is like, is it only your center who is following the overhead traction in Japan, or there are various other centers they are also following the same technique? Uh, 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 several centers uh, performed the same technique, but not so many. Uh, about uh, three or uh, five institution or six. Why it is like that? Why others are not following your protocol with a, such a good result? Why they are not following your protocol? Um, it is... Uh, something difficult it is a uh, we need a uh, education to parents education to uh, nurses so the it's sometimes uh, difficult uh, to do uh, uh, the OHT technique yes Gaurav would you like to ask so uh, I have one question for Dr. Hiroshi uh, how do you manage acute on chronic skiffies, uh, the ones which are uh, showing symptoms, but already, uh, I mean, acute on chron what is your management for acute on chronic slips? Uh, we do the same uh, protocol to uh, unstable. We showed here uh, the same technique. Okay. So we uh, probably uh, reduce the acute and uh, we never uh, reduce the chronic uh, sleep. Okay, yes, Sandeep, can you, uh, yeah. if there is so, no question, then can so you? There is, there is one more question from Ramani. He is asking 60 to 70 percent of unstable hips reduce spontaneously on mere traction. Do we need to do this elaboration, elaborate traction, inflection, and then gradual adjustment to achieve a reduction? I'm sorry. <laughs> Hello. I can I cannot uh, hear uh, from uh, Sandeep. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, can you repeat? Uh, uh, Bhai, could you get one? Yes. I can the question hear. is the question is I will repeat the question. 
Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Ramni has asked a question that many of the unstable slip can be reduced uh, spontaneously. Then why to go for such a like lengthy procedure of giving a traction and then going for a reduction? Uh, we think the important is the to reduce the intra-articular pressure. So uh, we performed uh, prolonged uh, traction, gradual traction. Okay, so that is to reduce the intra-articular pressure? Yes. Okay. But in that case, can't you decompress the joint by making a, or like inserting a needle in the joint and reducing the, uh, the hematoma or the fluid so that the joint is decompressed? Uh, we sometimes uh, uh, put the needle to uh, yeah, discharge the uh, hemorrhage during surgery but uh, uh, not so amount of uh, uh, blood can be uh, drawn. Okay, yeah, thank you. Sandeep, please. So, uh, what is the compliance dropout rate of your patient following the EDH protocol? How many patients drop out after a few weeks saying that this is too lengthy, we can't sustain this? Okay, the question is like, how many patients they uh, drop out from the treatment? So like, suppose you start a 20 patient, how many, uh, like all the 20, they complete the treatment or some of them, they go for some other treatment? Uh, in regard to overhead traction? Yes, yes. Oh. Yeah, no patient uh, dropped. Uh, we can treat all patient. Oh, that's great, yeah, that's great. Okay, the compliance is very good. Yeah. Okay. So, Gaurav, you wanted to ask? Yeah, I have a question from Dr. Prakash uh, from Ahmedabad. Uh, in DDH, in unilateral DDH, why the opposite hip is also kept in traction? Uh, uh, we think the pelvic uh, tilt is not so good for the treatment. So we uh, uh, have uh, bilateral traction uh, to uh, main, prevent pelvic uh, tilt. Okay, but do you keep the same weight on both the sides or the weight are different? Yeah, uh, same, same. Same, okay. Yeah. There is a question from Dr. Satidas. He is asking, how does that bump get absorbed? What is your long-term follow-up without doing modified value? Okay, the question is uh, like how your bump, uh, the residual bump get absorbed? Mm -hmm. The residual bump which you showed that in a long-term follow-up that bump was uh, absorbed in the case of the slip capital femoral epiphysis. Uh, so uh, how it is possible because most of us are under the impression that that bump remains for longer period, and uh, that is probably the reason why we uh, the child has osteoarthrosis in a long run, because that's the mechanism which is go on abutting the acetabular rim and cause problem. So we were really surprised to see the absorption of that bump in on the X-rays on the post-op X-rays. Uh, we think the uh, remodeling. So uh, during the growth, uh, the uh, osteoblastic action and the oste osteoabsorption, uh, uh, bone formation and bone absorption and can be expected uh, for children. So we think the remodeling uh, occurred in the metaphysical region. Is it an exception or it like occurs only once in a while or in every patient? Uh, I have, uh, we have uh, several patients who uh, spontaneously disappeared the uh, uh, bump. Okay, that's great. Okay. So I think uh, any more questions from Karan or uh, Doro? Uh, uh, one last question I would like to ask uh, for severe slips, 
uh, what kind of osteotomy intertrochanteric intertrochanteric osteotomy uh, do do you do dr hiroshi uh, in, uh, stable slip stable uh, cpr slip severe unstable slips uh, where the posterior tilt uh, tilt angle is more you you mentioned one osteotomy yeah uh when the uh, fortunately we haven't uh, uh, the patient uh, who didn't uh, remodel but uh, for the patient who have a, a posterior tilt angle of more than uh, 50 degrees uh, we will perform the uh, corrective osteotomy later what osteotomy uh, we showed here that the uh, subtrochanteric flexion osteotomy using uh, external fixator. Only flexion or uh, some other component also you add? Uh, we measure the CT preoperatively and uh, determine the varus or valgus. So if uh, we, when we need the varus, uh, we can uh, flexion flexed and uh, various uh, the multi planner uh, external fixator so we can uh, correct uh, multi planner thank you thank you so much <clears throat> okay taral you have any question hello taral no i think uh, we just end the session now yeah yeah thank you so I think uh, Dr. Hiroshi Kito has opened our eyes to a really uh, novel way of treating DDH and SCFE. And he has conclusively shown us with his work and the papers that he has published that uh, if your patient, a prolonged conservative treatment leads to spontaneous reduction in most of the cases. He has very few cases where he has done close reduction even. And open reduction is less than 1%. And age does not matter. Even up to five years, they have been able to do a closed reduction spontaneously by serial traction in different angles. And that has given them very little AVN rates. What remains is sometimes residual acetabular dysplasia for which you can do the Salter osteotomy. And he has shown that at maturity, you get perfect looking hips. The second thing he has also shown us is that traction is not a no-no even in unstable slips because uh, people believe that giving unguarded traction may actually tear the vessels and may cause complications or more AVN. Whereas he's showing that it encourages spontaneous reduction which you should accept and do minimally invasive fixation. No forceful reductions are done and rarely you will get AVN. He has shown hardly any AVN. And he has wonderfully shown that even the anterolateral bumps remodel and resolve, which itself is uh, something uh, unique. And uh, probably if we are less aggressive, we might see more better results. So thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kito, for opening our eyes to a completely new philosophy. And I hope you can come back and talk to us on many more topics. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you, Dr. Hirosh. Thank yeah, you. Thank, thank you, you, Professor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.